Concepts, the Center for HIV Identification Prevention and Treatment Services, as well as the Center for World Health, directed by Tom Coates. We feel really, really fortunate today that we got David Bangsberg from Harvard University and Massachusetts General Hospital to be our speaker to talk about adherence to HIV prevention, treatment and prevention. He, by training, is an internal medicine doc and he trained at Hopkins University and then went to Columbia for his residency and his fellowship. And he was lucky enough, and Tom was lucky enough, that he was one of Tom's fellows at UCSF where he started his HIV work. And from then, he's gone on to Massachusetts General Hospital where he's the director of global health. He went six years ago. He set up collaborations with eight different departments. He has 60 programs in 40 countries in the last six years. He um, coordinates all of global health for partners in health. He also, he's not only an MD, but also has a master's in public health. And he's one of the leading, one, he was one of the first researchers to work on adherence and has some of the best and most cutting edge applications. But he's also been a pioneer in the area of technology and how you use technology not in the typical researcher way for mom, small mom and pop studies, but how you introduce, implement, diffuse, and sustain technology in health systems. So personally, he works a lot both in India and in Uganda. So his trip to Uganda, in, that he goes 10 times a year. So I'm going four times a year to South Africa. I'm thinking I'm killing myself. 10 months a year, he goes to Uganda, and once he gets to Entebbe, the airport, it's a five-hour drive to the rural um, southwest border region of Uganda. It's a truly innovative and deep rural project. Um, he has published in every major journal and sits on the editorial boards of Plus Medicine, JAIDS, AIDS and Behavior, AIDS Patient Care and STD, AIDS Care, um, there are few people that you, could in, that, that you would have the pleasure to introduce who have accomplished so much so early and are making a difference in the lives of disenfranchised populations. So I know it's going to be really a treat today to hear David Bainsburg talk about his treatment and adherence programs. But before he comes up, I have two other announcements. That you're going to be lucky enough if you get to hear him now that at 2.30 he's going to talk about career kinds of issues in the Bel Air Conference Room, which is 17.323, and or at 5.30 he's going to talk to the medical residents in room 7.234. So those are, those are two opportunities to have more small informal conversations with David. Is that 17.324? 17.323. And 7234, I presume that's in the hospital? That's in the hospital, yeah. yeah. So um, without any further hesitation, unless there's, we're lucky enough, please help me in welcoming David Benson. Thank you, Mary Jane. And thank you, Tom, both of you, for inviting me to come to UCLA. It's great to. Uh, come back to the left coast. Uh, today I'd like to talk to you about adherence to HIV prevention and treatment uh, and focus on sort of social behavioral economic issues that have both enabled successful adherence and also create new challenges in terms of probably one of the most optimistic times we've had in the HIV epidemic where we can really understand a world where people are treated, um, new infections are limited, and people around the world uh, live long and productive lives. But I think while there, we have this great optimism, there are still many important challenges that await. Great, thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to start this story in 1997. When I was a infectious disease fellow and a Center for AIDS Prevention fellow, 
uh, at UCSF. A year after the development of effective HIV antiretroviral therapy, when HIV was turned from a, transformed from a terminal disease to a chronic disease, there was grave concern that as we expanded these miracle drugs to marginalized populations, such as the homeless and mentally ill or drug users, that failure to take all the medications would lead to the evolution of drug resistance in the individual, and that drug resistance could spread to a larger population. And as this New York Times article says, doctors withhold pill regimen from some, failure to follow a rigid schedule could hurt others they fear. So this time there was a public health argument to with limit access of it to HIV treatment to those who we believe would take the medication. And then this debate expanded when we too slowly recognized that most of the people living with HIV were in sub-Saharan Africa. And that there was the same concern that if we provide antiviral therapy to people who are living in extreme poverty, uh, with little education, that the short, potential short-term gains from reducing individual morbidity and mortality may be far outweighed by the potential for the long-term spread of drug resistance, resistance. In Africa, a higher proportion of patients are likely to fall in the category of poor adherers unless intensive adherence programs are available. And the discussion at this time was that maybe we should only prescribe antiviral therapy as directly observed therapy to make sure that every patient took every dose a uh, challenge which was uh, simply not feasible uh, then nor now. And thankfully, our group and many other groups started to study here and brought data to this argument. And the New York Times sums this up nicely that Africans outdo U.S. patients in following AIDS therapy. And we have seen to this day that levels of adherence and viral suppression have been excellent. 85-90% of people are suppressed, taking 90% of medications. And this has been a great success story. And now with HPTN052, where we've demonstrated that once people are on treatment, if they're taking their medications and suppressed, that they won't transmit the virus. With new prevention strategies like pre-exposure prophylaxis, we're beginning to talk about the end of AIDS. It's a great time. But as I mentioned in the introduction, challenges persist. I'd like to sort of go deeper into the factors that drive adherence both to HIV treatment as well as prevention and to highlight some of the challenges I think we have in store. So let me start with HIV treatment. And I refer to the work of Norma Ware a qualitative investigator at Harvard Medical School who looked at 220 people on HIV treatment in Tanzania, Uganda, and Nigeria and asked them to tell their stories of adherent success. This is shortly after we were seeing people take 95, 96% of their medications with unannounced pill counts, uh, unannounced pill counts and MEMS caps. And we were pretty certain that this adherence, that people were doing a great job adhering. And so Norma asked patients to tell their stories of adhering to medications. And she brings these stories together in themes. And the first theme is a theme that everybody describes of why they take their medications. is simply to improve their health. But this story gets more interesting when you understand the context of which people are taking their antiviral therapy in a rural African setting. They're taking therapy in a setting of extreme resource scarcity. Families will spend 30-50% of their, disposal, their income as a subsistence farmer simply to pay the cost of transportation to pick up medications in order to take them. And so it makes these levels of adherence even more extraordinary that people will overcome these financial barriers to take their medications. They'll give up 50% of their income simply to have access to treatment. So how do people do that? Well, they rely on relationships, relationships in their family, their social network, to ask for help. 
They started treatment when they were ill. They were often bed-bound. They went from working in a shop or working in a farm, helping produce for the family, to being bound in bed, or being in bed, where they could no longer assist their family, meet the, their economic, and, uh, uh, economic goals. And they often grew another person out of the family to care for that individual. When they start HIV treatment, they get healthy and they strong, they get strong, they go back to work. And they ask their family for help. They ask for the five or ten dollars for transportation to go to the clinic. They ask for help minding the shop, help in the farm, uh, such that they can spend a day uh, making it to the clinic to pick up their medications. And when they ask their relationships as a, for help, as a resource to overcome these economic barriers, they then understand that they have an obligation to adhere, to honor that help. By staying strong, by adhering to medications, by staying strong, by giving back and honoring that help, you can repay the individual who sacrificed to help you. By honoring that help, you strengthen that relationship such that next time you ask for help, the other person is more likely to help again. And you get this positive feedback loop of asking for help, honoring that help through adherence. And the economic value of the social relationship can be described as social capital. So here's another way to look at this, where our outcome is treatment adherence. And there are a number of things that influence treatment adherence. In what I call routine barriers, these are barriers that influence treatment adherence throughout the world, both here in LA, in Africa, in Europe, um, everywhere there's uh, treatment. These are side effects, depression, substance use, and memory, among other things. But that the key barrier unique to extremely poor settings are these structural and economic barriers, and that people use their social capital to overcome those barriers. To, in a statistical term, it's a operates as an effect modifier. And that, that social capital really min mitigates the impact of these structural and economic barriers. By framing social capital in this way, it really made me think of stigma, HIV stigma, in a whole different mindset. I used to think of stigma as something that's isolating, sort of a cognitive, emotional domain that keeps people from connecting, is depressing, as it, uh, it, it makes people feel bad, lonely, um, and isolated. But when you understand successful adherence through the lens of social capital, stigma takes on a whole other dimension. Because the person who can't disclose their HIV status to their family or friends also can't ask those family or friends for help. And it can't ask for that loan, help in the market, or help on the farm. And such that stigma becomes very structural in keeping people from accessing social capital to overcome their structural and economic barriers to adherence. But adherence is not just taking most of your medications most of the time. We're finding that patterns of adherence are really quite important. And this is a study led by Jessica Yugi, who looked at patients who are, at this time were on self-pay therapy before there was PEPFAR and free treatment in a setting, uh, in a rural Ugandan setting, and found that among patients on treatment, on self-pay treatment, that interruptions in treatment of more than 48 hours were quite common. There was more two interruptions every six months, and these interruptions lasted about 11 days on average. And that these interruptions accounted for 90% of all misdoses. And these interruptions were usually because there was a death in the family that re required the family to put together resources to bury a family member and there was no longer money to make it to the clinic and pick up the medications. And we see this really play out over and over again. And work by Becky Ginberg in the Mach 14 collaboration has characterized these interruptions as a very important cause of biologic failure. This is a study of about 1,100 people on electronic pill caps where we're comparing two factors, uh, two, two types of misdosis. On the left is total misdosis, so this is basically your average adherence over a 28-day period. How many days, equivalent days did you miss scattered over each month? And the more days you miss, the higher odds of viral rebound. 
But on the right, you see intervals that are consecutive days and minutes. These are in, con, contiguous days that define an interruption. And even when you control for average adherence, that if you're missing your days, days consecutively, you, that has an extra, an independent uh, effect on biologic rebound. And so it's not just average levels of adherence, but patterns of adherence are really quite important. And we've worked, looked at this with Jean-Jacques Parenti, um, patients on non nuke therapy uh, using electronic pill caps who interrupt their treatment spontaneously. And we've asked, what is the probability of maintaining viral suppression by the duration of interruption? So on the y-axis, you see the probability of biologic control, starting at 100 to 1, going down to 0. And on the x-axis, you see the uh, duration of interruption measured by electronic pill caps. So if a patient interrupts their medication for one or two days, you have a very high probability of maintaining biologic control. But at three or four days, that probability starts to decline. And at 14 days, you have a 50% chance of biologic rebound. And of those people who rebound, about a third or half of them will develop resistance. So this suggests that we have a window. If a family or if an in, in individual in a family experiences an economic shock, like a, a death in the family, and they can't make it to clinic to pick up that next refill, we have about three or four days to do something, get that person back on treatment before they have biologic rebound. So we've begun to leverage this relationship to ask, well, how can we intervene in real time? How can we support adherence before biologic failure rather than wait till after biologic failure and drug resistance? And we are using a strategy called uh, real-time adherence monitoring with this device called uh, the Wise Pill Monitor. This holds about a month of medications in this case. And every time this case is open and closed, it sends an SMS signal to a server to give you an electronic record of pill bottle open or pill container opening behavior, which is close, fairly close to actual pill ingestion behavior. There are differences, and, uh, but we're using this as a way to detect when people interrupt their therapy in hopes of intervening before they have biologic rebound. So here's a, one of our participants in Embarar, Uganda, rural southwest Uganda. She graciously allows us, allows me to show her picture. And here is her adherence record on a twice daily regimen. Something was happening over the weekend. She had to take her, probably to travel, take her doses early, uh, but it's pretty good adherence. And you'll note that on this last dot is September 8th, 2014. This was this morning, Uganda time. So if she, if she had a death in the family, or some other economic shock, and or couldn't make it to clinic, and she interrupted, we could count the, the, the days that she interrupted in real time, such that we could either send her an SMS text, we could call her up, or if this intervention, uh, interruption got long enough, we'd have to go out to her home and get her back on medications before biologic rebound and drug resistance. People ask, well, how do you pay for such a strategy? We have begun to look at, begin to answer that question with some work led by Maya Peterson at University of California, Berkeley, who's looked at electronic adherence data in the Mach 14 collaboration and asked the question, what happens if we have a good adherence record? Do we need to draw as many HIV RNAs when someone's, we know someone's taking their medications? So using machine learning uh, algorithms to look at all the dimensions of adherence, including pre-treatment viral load, the time that someone's been on treatment, how they're missing doses, both levels and patterns. She's been able to come up with a mathematical algorithm that predicts, predicts biologic rebound in real time quite precisely. Now those of you who are clinicians, you're drawing HIV RNAs about every three months in your patients, probably 90% of these are suppressed. Well, what happens if you had an adherence record and you said, well, I'm only going to draw HIV RNAs when there's about a 5 or 10% chance of biologic failure. And if someone has a, if I'm 95% sure that that person is suppressed, I'm going to withhold RNA testing. 
Well, using such a strategy in a 5%, uh, uh, 95% sensitivity, being, picking up all 95% of all potential biologic failures, and only drawing HIV RNAs when there's at least, um, uh, the algorithm says there's a risk of failure, we can cut laboratory monitoring costs by about 30% generating about $30 per month per patient. So just by reducing laboratory costs, you could pay for such a strategy, and that even is before we improve outcomes. So now we know people are adhering to treatment, treatment works, and when people are successfully adhering and suppressed, they're no longer transmitting HIV. We are now in an area where there's rapid, even further expansion of HIV treatment. And these are the WHO guidelines that were recent, not long ago, revised to support treatment for all patients living with HIV with less than 500 CD4 cells, also patients in discordant partnerships, and all pregnant women. This is a major expansion of treatment. There are certainly many challenges, but I'd like to focus on the challenges related to whether the challenges that may present to poor treatment adherence. We began to look at this in our cohort in rural Uganda and asked, is adherence the same for people with early stage disease uh, as it is for late stage disease? And we defined early stage disease as CD4 greater than 250 versus late stage disease uh, CD4 less than 250. We found that there really there was a small but not statistically difference in MEMS, electronic uh, pill cap adherence or MEMS adherence. But what we did find is that patients who had earlier disease or healthier were more likely, about two times more likely, to have a treatment interruption of greater than 72 hours. Remember, that's the period that you start to have loss of biologic control. And that these individuals who are had an earlier disease also were over two times uh, more likely to have incompletely suppressed RNA, controlling for all the reasonable um, co potential confounders related to adherence. Now this doesn't mean we shouldn't treat people with early disease, but it suggests that there may be different types of adherence behavior in people with early disease. And there's also data to the contrary, su suggesting by Dan Havler and um, suggesting that people with early disease are doing quite well. So I think this is very much an uh, uh, untested, uncertain area. But we are hypothesizing, given this adherence model and the importance of social capital, one could imagine and the thing that triggers such an investment in social capital is a decline in economic, um, uh, a decline in health and economic status. This is what gets the families engaged and motivated to make real serious sacrifices to help keep people on treatment. And as people who start treatment when they're asymptomatic, will they and their families understand the importance of keeping people on treatment without having seen someone recover from advanced disease. It's important to find out the answer to this question. You said there's evidence to support, to suggest that things will be fine. There's also evidence to suggest we should be concerned. I think it's important to, if there is a concern, to figure out early and then develop interventions that are tailored to people with early disease. But there's a lot more to successful HIV treatment in the end of days and just taking your doses regularly over a sustained period of time. And there's a whole, we understand now, a whole continuum or a cascade of HIV care that must be adhered to in order for treatment to be successful at limiting, at, at bringing the end of AIDS. And at every stage from becoming HIV infected to diagnosed to stage to be, determine your eligibility to initiating heart and re being retained on heart and adhering to heart, there is a fall off such that maybe only 30% of people who need treatment are actually on treatment, adhering to treatment. And I would like to focus on sort of one stage of this cascade led by Ingrid Katz, who looked at individuals in South Africa and found that 
Among individuals who are eligible for HIV treatment, 20% of them are refusing treatment. <coughs> and the number one reason that people refuse their treatment is first, they're concerned about stigma related to treatment, and they think they're too healthy to need treatment. We also know that people who are earlier in disease are less likely to disclose their HIV status. And again, without disclosing your HIV status, it's difficult, it's challenging to access the help you need to both access care and security care. So I think we, it's important to understand these bar the potential barriers, the real barriers in people with early disease to develop adherence interventions to support expansion of HIV treatment. Next slide to change here is the pre-exposure prophylaxis, a strategy where HIV negative people take daily antiviral medications to prevent the them becoming infected. This is a strategy which we have invested probably over $300 million in to understand whether an HIV negative person taking daily antiviral medications will lead to, will have protection based on those medications. There's been several large-scale randomized trials that have had very different results. Two trials, the pen prep trial and the voice trial, showed no efficacy. Some trials showed moderate, moderate efficacy of 44, 62%, and the highest efficacy estimates we've seen is 75%. So how do we explain the heterogeneity of these results? You know, does the strategy work or does it not work? Well, needless to say, I wouldn't be talking about adherence unless <laughs> it, whether people take these medications really helps us understand whether the strategy works and explains a lot of the heterogeneity between studies. So this, these are several of the studies where we are ranking the studies uh, by the proportion of patients with detectable drug in the blood. We've seen the highest proportion, uh, the highest uh, proportion of patients who were in the partner's prep study with HIV disordered couples where 81% of people had drug in blood. And this also had the highest estimate of efficacy at 75%. And as proportion of people with drug in blood goes down, so does the efficacy estimate. So then how do we explain the heterogeneity within these studies? Well, we did a detailed study of adherence in the Partners PrEP study led by Jessica Haber. We measured their adherence with unannounced pill count, caps, I'm sorry, unannounced pill counts, electronic MEMS caps, as well as interview, the patient interview uh, and self-report and clinic-based pill counts. And, doesn't matter what measure we looked at, we found that in this population who are stable, heterosexual, discordant couples in either Uganda or Kenya, we found that levels of adherence were exceptional between 90, uh, largely between 90 and 98 percent by every measure available. So this is a highly adherent population, and in this highly adherent population who one third were on placebo, two thirds were on active drug. We found that in the placebo group, there were 14, of 400, 14 infections of 404 participants, and there were zero infections among the 750 participants on active drug. So in a population that's taking between 90 and 100% of their medications, who are exposed to a positive, uh, positive partner, we found that the best estimate of adherence was 100%, with a 95% confidence interval between 87 and 100%. And there, Bob Grant has published additional data looking at mod modeling of the partner of the IPREC study and found very similar conclusions that among patients who are taking four out of five doses who have 80 or at least 90% adherence that this strategy is highly efficacious and efficacious to the level of antiretroviral treatment in the positive person. So how do we understand this heterogeneity? Why do we were shocked, we we're pleasantly shocked when we started studying page people in Uganda and see levels of adherence of 96 to 97%. We're seeing the same in Uganda uh, to, to pre-exposure prophylaxis. How do we understand these high levels of adherence? And how do we begin to explain the heterogeneity? 
But you're going to turn to the work of Norman Ware, who talked to individuals in a qualitative study and generated themes to understand adherence to prep. And in these discordant partnerships, the, the partnership, both people, individuals of partnership, described what they call the discordance dilemma. One person's positive, one person's negative. This creates stress in the relationship. The prospect of PrEP, and everyone knew this was a randomized controlled trial, they were either on placebo or active drug, they didn't know where the strategy worked, but the simple promise, the possibility that PrEP would protect the negative person from becoming infected, resolved this discordance dilemma. It brought the couple closer together it made their relationship stronger. And by making their relationship stronger, the, both the negative and the positive partner were very invested in supporting the negative person's adherence. They were both working as a team. And when they worked as a team, they became closer. They worked harder to support adherence, which gave them more confidence that they might be, more hope that they might be protected. And what patients describe is this made us love each other more. And that by engaging in partnership, that this was the factor that people most describe, most often describe, the strategy that supported their adherence. But this can also work in the opposite direction. Taking a negative person, <coughs> taking daily uh, medication, is a reminder that, yes, my partner is positive. There is this discordance. And if their trouble happens in a relationship, for instance, if the positive party goes out and has a relationship with somebody else and creates discord, then that discord combined with his memory of the discordant dilemma creates angst in a relationship. And the negative person says, this is not a good relationship. I don't want to take these medications. I don't want sex with this person. And then they stop taking their prep. And such that the quality, the how well the relationship is doing was one of the important factors of how well patients adhere to PrEP. And this is described quite well in this picture, uh, courtesy by uh, Fran Pretty of the Avi study. This is a um, study looking at pre-exposure prophylaxis in discordant, uh, stable, heterosexual couples. And this is a MEMS cap, and this is a Truvada, presumably, and the MEMS cap. And <clears throat> the story behind this men's cap is the negative person found that her positive partner had an affair with someone else. And she took this men's cap and threw it at him. Thank we missed him, hit the wall. And threw it with such force that it not only broke the men's cap, it broke the Truvada tablets. We're trying to recruit this person for the Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> we need him, need, need her. But just a very visual example of how the power of the relationship can either support adherence or compromise adherence. So going back to our model, we still find, in Norma's work, we find that there's still structural economic barriers, even in the study of accessing PrEP. People still have to make it to the clinic to pick up the PrEP, and that's, that is a major challenge. People also describe that the negative person describes HIV stigma as an important barrier to adherence because by taking daily medication, people, their family members or neighbors may presume they're adherent, they're positive, and are concerned about that disclosure. And they also describe routine barriers such as side effects, depression, substance use, and memory, and all these go to influence PrEP adherence. But it's really the support of the relationship, of the partner, which mitigates each of these factors to support adherence which helps us understand the heterogeneity in some of the studies in that the highest level of adherence was in stable discordant partnerships. The lowest level of adherence were women in South Africa who were recruited outside their partnership. The, their partner was not part of the adherence counseling, not necessarily part of the strategy. Many of those women described having concealed PrEP use from their partners, which created a major, not only didn't have the support of their partners to support adherence, but also created a major barrier to adherence. <coughs> and my major contribution to the study was coming up with a title by Channel <laughs> Tina Turner, What Has Love Got to Do With It? What has love got to do with it? 
All the rest of the credit goes to normal wear. <laughs> um, so I'd like to end with two more points to make. Um, I'd like to end with a, a, a case of a, a, of a patient we uh, followed in London, a patient that's inspired by this quote by Andrew Nazios that Africans don't know what Western time is when, um, and don't know what you're talking about when asked to take drugs at specific times. Not the only embarrassing thing that a U.S. Uh, public official has ever said. <laughs> so this quote inspired us to publish uh, uh, a patient's experience uh, led by a medical student at UCSF, now uh, Marissa Mayer, now at OHSU. So David, I just, I just went to this home visit. I found this person named John. He has no education. He works as a farmer. He lives with his extended family in a three-room mud walled house. If you survey the entire household, you see a lantern, a bed, a bike, a sofa, and a radio, but no watch. Ergo, the not just quote, how is this person with no education, with no timekeeping device, going to take his medication? He started HIV treatment at a fairly advanced disease. We measure his adherence with a MEMS cap that records every time his pill bottle is open and closed. And here is his adherence record where every dot yeah. is the time he opens up his pill bottle. You see a series of dots around 7.20 a.m. and a series of dots around 7.20 p.m. If you sum this up, he's taking 90% of his doses within 10 minutes of 7.20 a.m. And in the evening, he's a little bit looser. It takes him a whole total of 17 minutes to get 90% of his doses in. And his overall adherence is 98.9% and the 1.1% is a MEMS cap failure. So some of you know this story. To the others, I ask you, this is not minute-by-minute minute adherence. This is second-by-second second adherence. How does this individual have such precise adherence without a watch? Radio. Many people also say, radio is half the answer. Many people say, he's on the equator. And so it's a sunrise and sunset. In fact, it's both. <coughs> What happens is, <laughs> living on the equator, the sun rises at 7 a.m. every day. He turns on his radio, and at 7.20 a.m. there's the equivalent of the BBC or NPR. It's called Radio West. So good morning, this is Radio West. He hears a show come on, takes his morning dose, turns the radio off, goes to the field, uh, works in the field to prepare food for his family, comes back in the evening, the sun sets at what time in the evening, 7 o'clock in the evening, all year round, turns on the radio. Radio West also plays in the evening. Guess what time? 7.20. Takes his evening dose, turns off the radio, goes to bed, and starts another day. But this isn't the end of the story. Here's his adherence for the first 90 days, and here is his adherence uh, for subsequent uh, 90 days. And you see these interruptions of two or three days which I think is drive, is the pattern of adherence is driving virologic rebound. And so the question is what happens to John such that he misses his doses in consecutive days? Drug outs. Stock outs. His clinic has medications, but you're warm. Batteries? Batteries are still working. Remember, he's only using the batteries a couple of minutes a day. Something happened to John that's happened to everybody in this room. Fatigue? Hmm? Fatigue? Fatigue? Mm. No, I think it's more common than that. A lot more fun. Nap? Having sex. Warming up. <laughs> <laughs> even, even better than that. He falls in love. Falls in love with an HIV positive partner. Her partner goes to a different clinic, and her clinic has a stock out. And he's sharing his medications with her to keep her on treatment. The reason I like this story is, I think, the reason I like the story is it provides makes a few points. First, someone who's poor, never been educated, day in his life can come up with a very creative strategy and have precise adherence. 
despite challenges. And second, it's not just about the individual, it's about social relationships. It's about where that person's living, who they're living with, who they care for, and who they are supporting. And third, it's about drug supply and distribution. It's not about remembering to take the dose, it's about making sure that people have access to treatment. <coughs> so in conclusions, first I've learned through this work is, is humility. And that myself as an individual and us as a field have been wrong most of the time. First we thought it would be the homeless and the drug users in New York City and LA and San Francisco that would generate drug resistance. Well that didn't happen. Second, we thought it would be poor people living in sub-Saharan Africa that would generate global drug resistance. Well, that didn't happen either. Third, we thought, well, everyone's going to, we're going to invest $300 million in randomized controlled trials because PrEP makes sense and people will take it. Well, it sort of happened sometimes, but it didn't happen other times. And that it really requires careful evidence and the continually questioning our assumptions of how people will behave and for what reasons. And I suggest that just very simple, basic data question, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, is important, in, and humility is important in understanding how we can really achieve the end of AIDS. Second, social context really matters, and it matters for HIV treatment as well as it matters for HIV prevention. And then the strength of ties and how we leverage these ties is a major tool we have to support adherence and promote success. And then reliable prep adherence is the, one of the answers, not the only answer, one of the answers is engaging the partner to support adherence. And as we expand treatment, and we should expand treatment as fast as we can, we should need to keep a very close eye with the sense of humility as to what may be new and in unanticipated barriers to treatment adherence so such that people can best benefit from expanded access. But before I end, I can't really have a talk in the presence of Tom Coates uh, without talking a bit about mentorship. I'd like to highlight two mentors. First is Andrew Moss, and, um, who is a PhD epidemiologist who helped describe how HIV was transmitted in San Francisco in the early 80s. And took me on after uh, as an infectious disease fellow. I had just written my very first manuscript in New York City, and it came back for review. And this is what the reviewer said as I was just got to know Andrew. And said, in some a well-designed study, an important contribution to the field of nosocomial transmission of tuberculosis. <laughs> but I strongly recommend the author find an editor whose first language is English. <laughs> I wish I saved the letter. I've looked for it over and over again. And I showed the paper to Andrew. And Andrew says, the reviewer is completely right. Your prose is torture. Let's start with a sentence and work our way up to a paragraph. <laughs> and it was about that time. I was working on my second paper. Oh. <laughs> and I, we had a peer review at the Center for AIDS Prevention. And this, this person showed up. I didn't know who it was. And he said, I'd like to read, I read your paper, here are some comments on the paper. This is a really, it wasn't much better than the first paper. <laughs> and it was Tom, and I really figured out, oh, okay, this, is, this is the boss. This is, um, um, I'm flattered to have him read my paper once. And then he said, after the peer review, he said, oh, I want to see another draft tomorrow. <laughs> and I sent him another, another draft. I did work early in the morning and um, sent it to Tom. Sent it to Tom about 6 o'clock in the morning. And, 6.20, I had edits back. <laughs> and he said, better, I want to see another copy tomorrow, another version tomorrow. And we did this, and Andrew was working on this. Um, and daily, just iterative, helping me turn my tortured prose into a decent sentence and decent paragraph. And through Andrew and Tom's sort of daily attention, bit by bit, uh, the paper eventually got published, and we did a little bit better, it got published in JAMA. Uh, so, I would like to make two points with an example. First, um, 
it's always possible to do better, and it's a daily iterative work. And to do better really requires great mentors, and it requires great mentors like Andrew and Tom, and we'd like to thank them very much for uh, their attention over the last uh, couple decades. <laughs> Also important to acknowledge Bruce Walker, my mentor at Harvard, who uh, is, a, along with Tom, one of my role models in leadership. The work has been led by Jessica Haber at Harvard, Peter Hunt, and Jeff Martin at UCSF, Connor Mazzora at Murrah University, Norman Ware we talked about, uh, Tony Pelham, and Jared Bayton led the press study, and were funded uh, largely by the NIMH with some support from the Gates Foundation. Thank you very much.